Hello. Aloha, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Or I'm saying this morning because it's Steve's morning. He's in Thailand now. So what do you got? For the next few months. Michelle and I are here in Hawaii and the, the winds have really picked up. So if our internet goes out, you can hang out with Steve. Oh, yeah, we're lucky. Lucky. Winter, winter has come. So take a few few moments to look at our Sangha friends. Takes time to see everybody. <laughs> it's good, good to do. Hmm. Okay. So as you're ready, getting into your seated posture. Letting your eyes come to close. And starting to just welcome all of the realms and layers of sense experience that are available right now. presenting their textures and tones, qualities. It's said that in the forest, all of the different species of animals have found the frequency of their tones, of their songs, of their rumblings in relationship to one another. You have mammals at the low end, some places with elephants and giraffes at the subsonic end. Through humans and monkeys in the higher ends, and to the birds, even higher register, and insects higher than that, and bats out of our hearing range, and our inner landscape is something like that. all these different registers of each of the sense doors playing in their own spectrum. And the bandwidth of sound and physical sensation. Those of visual impressions, smells, tastes, 
the huge variety within the heart mind. And within each of these bandwidths, a, a huge range of experience across the spectrum. In the body, this range of coolness and warmth, pressure, motion. Hardness, softness, lightness. We are not trying to get rid of any of the bandwidth, any of the spectrum or sensations, including all of those that we encounter in the mind, heart, Emotions, thoughts, high pitched chatter, low rumblings. In the realm of sound, all these phenomena have their place. Our job is to listen. understand the spectrum, each bandwidth, how they are related, how they weave together, form a sense of wholeness, coherence, and how they are independently. We bring the attention to one field. The stream of sound. The sensations of physicality throughout the body. Or perhaps more narrowly where the hands are touching. Or this rhythm of the rising and falling of the breath at the abdomen. Whether long or short, relaxed or contracted, this wave of motion, expansion, release, this is one wave. One frequency we can attune to and try to stay connected with as it changes, fluctuates, moves. And building a relationship with one frequency. Primarily. But knowing that it doesn't intend to get rid of all the others, sound is still happening. Mind is still happening. Smell, taste, sight. These other frequencies will call the attention. And we can receive them in the same way. 
noticing their undulations, their changes, their rhythms, patterns. tone, and trusting that there's a value to coming back to a baseline of the breath. The hands are the whole body seated. We're receiving these textures and tones of sound. Trusting that we can learn all we need to know from deeply understanding any one of these frequencies. We practice primarily where the attention can make a connection and stay connected without too much strain too much intensity. As we explore all of the spectrum of experience in this inner wilderness,
I've always um, appreciated this time of year. It said it's the time when um, the constellation Pleiades, some, some know it as the seven sisters or Subaru. It's the time when um, Pleiades rises at sunset and at midnight, it's overhead. It's called the mid midnight culmination of Pleiades. This is the time period that this happens. And the Pleiades is considered the mother of the universe, the mother of the whole universe in many cultures, particularly indigenous cultures. Uh, so it's, it's really in Hawaii, it's the time of peace. It's considered the time of peace. It's so profound. It's, and so, um, Because uh, Thanksgiving is soon and a time of gratitude, I think that that we we like to take in that whole um, the deeper ancient way of understanding this holiday, this time of year. I think of it as a time of respect and reverence and gratitude and peace. And in a way, this time of year is, is very humbling. And I think it's because we're so in between worlds that the summer is behind us and the, for the, us in the Northern hemisphere and the, the intensity of the long winter is ahead. We're a month from the winter solstice. And of course, I think we get more of a sense this time of year of, um, even without the global climate change, how much is out of our control with nature. For example, here, um, we're having at least where I live, 55 mile per hour winds. And this morning, late morning, I looked up and uh, my view um, on an island, my view is of the mountain Hualalai, which is over 9,000 feet. And I looked up and there was a, a dirt cloud, not a dust cloud, like a thick dirt cloud that was bigger than the mountain. Like it was just, it's truly amazing, you know, just this kind of power of nature and the, just the winds, you know. And then um, I wanted, I was working on my talk, but once in a while I looked out and there was a point where this <laughs> dust cloud like settled over the ocean, like the ocean turned brown. It was amazing. It's just amazing. And like, I'm amazed that you can't hear it. Like it's so, this wind is so loud where I am. I keep thinking, are you going to be able to hear me? <laughs> but of course we're on, we're on Zoom, so you can't, but um, it's, a, it has this, um, this time of year has a power. And I think particularly around the power of um, knowing what it's like if we didn't have electricity and the darkness and being able to always start turning toward that darkness is a, is a very important part of our, our lives. And I think that the, what happens is we really, we really get to appreciate the sun you know, where I live, it's, the sun is very intense, but now um, I see it as this beloved friend star that is bringing warmth, right? Our star, our home planet star, it's so moving. The sense of gratitude we can have, I think can be very different than even though in the summer it's growing, it's helping grow food and the trees, it's, it's, bringing about a lot of pleasantness, but also um, we might forget that we're taking it for granted. And I think there's a way this time of year that we can feel so small, but in a really profound way, winter has that way of um, 
helping us see the just even the vastness of the darkness of the sky and the the other night when I looked up at the Milky Way, it looked like confectioner sugar. There were so many stars. It looked like, you know, just confectioner sugars, you know. And I think that this this um this is meant to be a time where we slow down. And I think it's so profound that humans we tend to speed up for the holidays we tend to speed up at the very time that the message is slow down slow down slow down uh, start to appreciate the darkness and um, the power of one light in the room right that, that we can still see so what i'm kind of aiming toward because of course it's the thanksgiving the there's a generosity of the earth and sky and planets and um, pleiades that that in a way we're meant to tune into more this time of year there was a a book called uh cinder there is a book called cinderella and her sisters by barry and ann ulanoff and in it they said that gratitude is dependency acknowledged and so this week could be a time of that, of really acknowledging the healthy, the health of acknowledging that kind of dependency because it's true. It's so true. The loving kindness practice was always much more challenging for me than the wisdom practice. I mentioned this last week in my instructions, but I remember um, the first time that I really felt like I genuinely felt loving kindness for myself. It was, it's so vivid. I was in the parking lot in Bangor, Maine, in the middle of winter. Like it was so cold and there was so much snow. And I had come outside and I was freezing and I had to wait wait for my friends and I was standing in the wind the wind chill factor was probably 20 below zero and the, I felt the sun the warmth of the sun on the little bit of skin that was showing you know how you have so much on in winter and I felt that warmth and I felt oh this is how loving kindness feels for myself like I felt it so much like the element of that warm sunlight and warmth, my whole system relaxed. Um, and I even a cartoon kind of came into my mind of like, I know this is so <laughs> impermanent. I know this experience for myself is so impermanent. I wanted to like hold it, like hold it like a frame of a film. I wanted to just hold it open for a few seconds and just bask in it. Uh, it was so powerful. And I felt so much gratitude because I knew that that would come again at some point and that I could start to access it and cultivate it. So this, I think that sometimes that ability for us to take things for granted needs so much um, challenging, really, uh, the, in the best ways that we can without judgment. So gratitude tends to depend particularly on our ability to not take things for granted and then to receive what's happening, whether it's a thought or a sound or a smell or a taste or the breath or an emotion that um, receiving requires letting go of control. It requires a surrender. And I think that in our daily lives, we can underestimate our capacity to slow down at certain places. So say so maybe we take half our meal to be in silence and quiet and to just receive the food. It doesn't even have to be the whole meal. It doesn't have to be every meal, but it 
these kind of small ways that we can slow down, I think are so important. Um, when we do the month long retreat with the Brahma Viharas uh, in our homes, I know I've had such um, powerful experiences teaching those retreats. Now we've had two that I look forward to the time where I'm spending a whole week on joy and, and gratitude and a whole week on metta, a whole week, right? On equanimity, compassion. It's like, because um, when you do it in your home, it, it, it has power. You remember, oh, I, I was walking down the steps with such gratitude for the steps, for the walls of my house, right? For the floor, for the toilet. Like there's just no end to that ability to start slowing down and receiving the sound of the wind, for example, now. Yeah, it's like a bit loud. And I think sometimes it takes some effort to, in the unpleasant aspects of life, to find um, a teaching in it that we can be grateful for. So for example, I qualify scientifically now for long COVID. Um, some scientists say you have to wait three months. So I've hit, I've hit, I'm over three months. So I'm definitely in long COVID. And um, it requires so much patience to appreciate how slow this um, no energy it has been unfolding or low energy or no energy. And I've, I've had this amazing, um, need to remember what gear I'm in. So often I'm in a pretty kind of hummingbird gear. That's just sort of my karmic energy field. And this is probably the opposite of my karmic energy field. It's like, and I kind of joke to myself, like, okay, let's shift to a lower gear. And it's like, nope, shift to the lower gear. Nope, <laughs> shift to the lower gear. And then I go into no gear and I stop and I laugh because that feels like what I'm experiencing with this long COVID bay. You know, not everybody, but it's just so interesting to see how um, I know there's energy deep in the well. Really down deep in the well, there's some energy. I know that, but I have to just stop and wait and wait, sometimes it's 30 minutes a day, I get the well water, right? And it's just um, teaching me so much. I have to say, not always what I want, but it's teaching me so much. And one of the things um, I found recently, I was reading, oh, some Carl Jung, um, from his um, elder years. And he had gotten very sick when he was 70, in his early 70s, very sick. And um, I, I read this one sentence, which he said that he had to stop all correspondence. And that was very important in his life, like correspondence with people wanting help and him reflecting back to them what he saw. and. Uh, offering what he could. Uh, and he had to stop it entirely for a few years. And I recognized, oh, I've had to stop so much correspondence. Like, but I hadn't seen it. I hadn't recognized it. And just that, that those moments of like, oh, gra grateful that I could explain to some people, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not corresponding. I didn't get it. You know, it's just like, oh, Okay, it's okay, you know, just lower the gear, lower the gear, lower the gear. And in that quiet, silent, low gear or no gear, I have great reverence for that place. Great, great respect. It's a, it's a very much a non-doing place. Uh, that I'm learning so much from. In this kind of wind, 
it's very hard on the feral cats. They can't hear any predators. They, they really have to stop. I watch them. It's like this morning early, they dared to come out and eat because they were they're so hungry. But then I could see, oh, probably we won't see them for a while because it's they, it's amazing how much they depend. They depend on their hearing there. And so they just they're amazing. They just lay low. I don't know where they are, but they lay low. They trust again. They're trusting that just stopping and just being. It's very powerful, this trusting that kind of, I think, real humility. <clears throat> so part of what um, I'm trying to say about slowing down this time of year is that out of that acknowledgement of the dependency for example, on the sunlight or the darkness, we start to see that the earth, the, the universe, the sky, we're held by the stars, right? Planets, darkness, we're held by it. We're held by the earth. It's our home. We're held by the wind and the calm and the earth and the water, the changes. And it, it's like the, these, it brings us more deeply non-conceptually into the insights around anicca, dukkha, anatta. Yeah, it's it's like it's it's natural when we're in that kind of quiet, uh, being guided by the humility. Yeah, we're navigating by that, not being in control, not having aversion and attachment, um, be so so much in charge. On November 1st, 1858, Henry, Henry David Thoreau wrote in his journal, a person dwells in their native valley like a corolla in its calyx, like an acorn in its cup. Here, of course, is all that you love. Just, just to just know that we can relate to our home, our neighborhood, our earth, our universe. It's like here, here is all that we love. And, and it's just inspiring really to abide more deeply where we live very microscopically or very macroscopically. The Buddha said so many amazing things like, um, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't let one meal go by without sharing it. I remember when I first heard that, I just started sobbing. Just the, the, the truth of that, the, the profundity of that power of knowing how much we depend on food or water and how hard it really is, how hard it is existence itself. And then he had said at some point at the end of his life, all of the spiritual, all of the spiritual life is friendship. All of it, not just 50%, but 100% of the holy life, of the spiritual life, is friendship. These are very meaningful teachings. They're pithy. They don't require a whole book. They require a lifetime of practicing it, just knowing where is, where is our gratitude? What are we grateful for again this week? And, and to know that a spiritual life rests that deeply on friendship. Someone sent me a link to um, a little, a film, a documentary on, it's Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama. 
uh, meeting up and talking. It's it's called something like joy, and um, each of them kind of spend time at the beginning of the film telling each other how much they appreciate each other, their friendship. It, it's it's just joyful. And Desmond Tutu started. He started by saying to the Dalai Lama, till my death, I carry your spirit. They don't see each other very much. But to have a friend, a spiritual friend, till my death, I carry your spirit. There's so much reverence respect and gratitude in that. I um, share poems by Saigyo a lot because I have such deep gratitude for his insights. He lived from 1118 to 1190, very uh, much a recluse. And what I love about him is that he admits to all the difficult emotions and makes them his friend. So this is probably one of my favorites. He said, hoped for, hoped for, looked for guests, never made it to my mountain hut. The now congenial loneliness I'd hate to live without. So he is not saying that he didn't have attachment right? or wanting. There's such a yearning there, hope for, look for guests, but they didn't come. And over years, he made loneliness his friend, yeah, his guest, his, but free with it, not weighted down by it. But I bet he died of loneliness many times before he found that relationship, right? The relationship of wise attention, the, the wisdom awareness and the Brahma Viharas, that like the kind, compassionate, empathetic, equanimous attention. Powerful. There's a great um, woman, Christiane Ritter, who in 1933, she was from Austria, traveled from Austria to the Arctic <laughs> to spend a year with her husband. He was an explorer and researcher. Now, this is not down coats and down this and down that. This is not the old, uh, this is old, old ways of exploring the Arctic, very, very difficult. Um, there was just this bleak little hut that she was in. They were 60 miles from the nearest neighbor. But at the end of the year, where she went through just, you know, months of darkness and months of terrifying storms, and bears. She lost all of her fear of the bears, by the way. But she said, the Arctic does not yield its secret for the price of a ship's ticket. You must live through the long night, the storms, and the destruction of human pride. Do we actually think about each day that it's about destroying our human pride? Yeah, that that kind of destruction would be a good thing for us. 
Yeah. How 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 beautiful. Not that not a healthy pride. I don't mean the healthy pride. I mean the attachments and aversion. Uh, the the controlling nature, the manipulation, the trying to get trying to get rid of rather than the being with what is. Uh, she said, you must have gazed on the deadness of all things to grasp their livingness. Mm, so much beauty. And we, we really, I think it's like, especially nowadays, we get, we get so much input what other people think about things, <laughs> whether it's politics or, you know, neighbors or, right? I mean, it's just so easy to know what somebody in the Ukraine is thinking or Australia or just like, it's amazing how much, it's hard enough to deal with our own thoughts, right? What we're thinking. So I think it's quite easy for us to, feel like we want people to be thinking what we think they should be thinking yeah and and how that can manifest in the or the motivation of aversion to the unpleasantness of that the 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 motivation of the hatred or the aversion or even if we keep it quiet and we don't show it the the difficulty we have with others belief systems and so that i think that um whether it's a, in our very private world or personal world or the greater world um i think that accepting that aversion is really important because if we don't we're often just just getting caught in the righteousness and blaming and thinking and thinking and thinking we we really if we had control of the world, it would be a better place. And of course, I think in some ways it probably somewhat would, but um, we don't have that kind of control, right? We can do the best we can. But I, I think that um, it's the same with the pleasure that you see that Saigyo didn't try to um, repress that yearning. He, he really faced it. And... Uh, and it's the same with the aversion or attachment where we're being able to be grateful that we have enough wise attention, that we can see it clearly, and we don't, we have a choice. We don't have to be um, motivated by the attachment, motivated by the aversion, but we can let it move through. We can accept that. It's just like this extreme wind. It's like a force that is moving through, and it's a great it's example because whether you can't control it's like i can be upset by it but it's not, not going to help anything right it's the same it with inner thoughts and emotion it's like it's letting it move through with wise attention with with a relationship with it but where the relationship means there's an ability to observe it and not be caught in it not drown in it this is something to be so grateful that we can do that we're in this time of the dispensation of the Buddha that we can actually learn how to be free, free from suffering. Quite a long time ago, I uh, found a poem by Pablo Neruda and he wrote it before he died. And he wrote, um, he called it his uh, autumn, autumn testament. But it's really his um, testament and will. But it's huge. It's like huge, not some like, what should, <laughs> should I give somebody my furniture or something? This was a very different kind of will. So this is just one little part, but he said, has anyone been granted as much joy as I have? It flows through my veins. And this fruitful, unfruitful mixture that is my nature. I've been a great flowing river 
with hard ringing stones, with clear night voices and dark day songs. To whom can I leave so much, so much and so little? Joy beyond its objects, a lone horse by the sea, a loom weaving the wind. And do we feel that way? To whom could we give so much, so much and so little? Yeah. And I remember when I first read this many years ago, early 80s, when I saw joy beyond its objects, I understood that this was joyful interest. This is like Joy beyond its objects is really when we break the pleasure pain syndrome. We break the chain of being attached to pleasure and aversive to unpleasantness and um, not a delusion, right? It's huge. The awareness that is no longer caught in the objects. So there's fear, but we're not caught in the object of the fear. There's anger, but we're not caught in the object of the anger. There's happiness, but we're not caught in the object of the happiness, et cetera. It's like, huh. So that's called joyful interest because it's joyful not to be caught. But it has nothing to do with pleasure, the happiness of pleasure. It has to do with the contentment of freedom. So this incredible interest in what is happening versus what we're wanting to get or get rid of, this, this is um, so powerful, so important. And I think that it takes a certain amount of courage, this uh, joyful interest. Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj in the book, I Am That, said that attachment destroys courage. And I think that's such an important, beautiful thing to, to, to reflect on and include in our understanding of gratitude and so you know when when we're wanting to connect with someone for example or ourselves or someone or some being if we're wanting if we're wanting them to be a certain way right we have this idea of how things should be we're not really connecting with things as they are and that that wanting kills the connection there's not a possibility even with our own fear if we're wanting it to if we're if we're attempting to connect with fear but we're attached to it going away that's not this kind of awareness it's not the awareness infused with wisdom or kindness so the awareness is infused with fear or aversion of the fear itself the, these are so interesting when we have enough um, energy and mindfulness and some kindness, I think, when fear appears, can we see if, or it might be a friend that is afraid or another being, if we can have that sense again of like kind of stepping back and seeing if we're attached to that person being different than how they are, or ourselves different than how we are. So it's that it's like that um, the price of the courage is not being caught in the attachment. It's not a bad price. And of course, if the attachment 
doesn't wiggle, it doesn't move, and we're caught in the attachment, then we see if we can connect with the attachment, right? There's no like bad practice or experience. It's not like, oh no, I couldn't, I couldn't wiggle that. It's like, no, it's just like that's what's predominant in the moment. That's what's happening in the moment. We see if we can connect with the wanting. And then the wanting will come and go by itself. We just let it move through. And I'm giving the example of the wind right now because there's no stopping this wind. And there's no feeling that it's out there in my house. It's just so strong. It's just moving through. And sometimes these experiences we have are that intense. Hmm. And so. That might be enough. Let's see. I had a lot of different ways to end, but I think I'm going to end with Sri Nazargadatta Maharaj. The question is, um, what do you mean by saying that you are beyond space and time? It's a long answer, so I'm going to not read the whole thing. Having realized that I am one with and yet beyond the world, I became free from all desire and fear. I did not reason out that I should be free. I found myself free unexpectedly. This freedom from desire and fear remained with me since then. I have also found that thoughts become self, self fulfilling, things would fall in place smoothly and rightly. The main cha change was in, my, in the mind. It became motionless and silent, responding quickly, but not perpetuating the response. Spontaneity became a way of life. The real became natural, and the natural became real. And above all, infinite affection, love, dark and quiet, radiating in all directions, embracing all, making all interesting and beautiful, significant and auspicious. We can be grateful. We can even hear that. Never mind. Aim toward it. <laughs> okay. And so we do have some time for questions. If anyone has any, you can go down to the reactions button on the bottom of your Zoom screen and click uh, your, your hand, your raised hand, like Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Talking about gratitude, I wonder if any of you can give us an update on the Metadona project and how can we help um, as part of my practice, the uh, monks and nuns in Burma now, those of us who can help. Yeah. 
Did Can you hear you that, Michelle? It no. was about the. It was about the. If we uh, speaking of gratitude, if we could offer any in, update on the Metadonna project. I, I think that um, we're having a board meeting about that next week. But um, there's very little um, we can get into the places we would like to in terms of offerings right now we have a we have a number of connections but we don't want them to get killed because they're helping people it's and they've made um they've made organizations like metadata illegal now that happened last month so that if people are involved with any of this they can be killed or jailed so not an easy time um you can get, like I said, little bit, we can get little bits in, but everyone we know has told us um, to be very careful and not, not now. Um, but we have a project outside of Burma and Thailand that we're, we're going to work with that um, is helping young people, kind of like the refugees, the young students that either have a choice of um, basically becoming soldiers because they care so much, you know, the fighting, they're, they're either going to fight or they're going to become trained as leaders and waiting for the time when they can come back in and, and do their the good work. So we're working on developing two programs for that right now very excited about it and of course still seeking avenues to send more in but we've heard that the people that we've worked with over the years in Burma the nuns and monks are okay so far so yeah that's my best update yeah and we'll be sending an email out actually yeah, in the yeah. next couple of days about it so that's good timing the the nun a lot of you know da using a we've been in touch with and she they're okay but again she doesn't want to get anybody hurt and uh, has reassured us that she's okay we're not going to be going in anytime soon because we could be put in jail <laughs> we are now illegal And I guess I want to say thanks, Samantha, for bringing it up. And it, it's not, as we all know, in a lot of places on the planet, it's not an easy time. And um, we will keep doing our best. Rose, do you have a question? I just noticed that you're unmuted. If I can't see you now, okay, here we'll. His son. Oh, you're still muted there. Hmm. <clears throat> there you go. Yes, yeah, so I grew up believing, believing in Kuan Yin. Since I was young, I just invoked. Kuan Yin's name every time I feel I need protection. But now that um, I study the Dharma, I, I know that Kuan Yin doesn't exist. And yet, I 
and use the invoker name on the time. To allow, now I try to use um, um, Steve method, meta. So whenever I, I worry as if that meta or that may, may I be safe. Um, I wonder if it was. You wonder if what? If it would work. Hmm. If it's what? If it would work. Wait, if what? it works, doing meta. Ah, uh, does it work, meta? Just like saying meta for myself or for my family. Just put, so I just like put out intention there and then whatever comes and come. But since, since there's not the silicone, it's not there to help. I don't know if you, I have lots to say, but I could start. Yeah, Jesse, go yeah. For it. I, I think that um, I feel like we need all the help we can get. Like, I really feel like humans need all the help they can get and that what we were um, raised with has a great power for us that we also can transform our relationship to what we were raised with. But certainly I have a um, very interesting experience that when I first moved to Hawaii, to Honolulu and um, went out in a kayak through these massive waves and I grew up on a lake, you know, no waves. And uh, the wind started carrying me out way out in the very deep ocean and uh, going out and um, when I turned around, I freaked out. Like I was so far out. I felt like I would, I didn't have enough arm strength. I felt like I was gonna blow to Japan. Really, it was so intense. And, um, and then I also knew I was gonna have to go back through. These were very big waves. So I, when I was starting to go back through the waves, there was a part of me that came out from my very young childhood. Of course, I have that Irish Catholic thing, but I just yelled. I didn't just invoke Mary. I yelled, Mary, <laughs> Mary, Mary, help, right? Yeah, and it was like so natural. It was just like, I'm not gonna, in these moments, I don't feel like it's good to say, well, maybe Mary doesn't exist because Mary is a form, however one can deepen our understanding of these energies, um, she's certainly a form of loving kindness. And Kuan Yin is, is meant to be accessing a certain level of compassion. And then our, our wisdom practice is meant to come in and uh, understand that uh, you yourself, who are you, right? You're not really son, right? So Mary isn't really Mary. So it's like, it's important to, I think, depending on the circumstance, <laughs> you know, be careful of having these ideas of what we should do. And uh, I remember coming in and uh, coming up into the house where Steve's mother was. And I joked with Steve's mother. I said, wow, I started calling Mary. I haven't done that since I was like four. And she, it was just fun. It was laughing. It was great. It was like, I think it's important to have some um, lightness of spirit with it. You could, you could start with Kuan, Kuan Yin, and then in two mi two minutes, drop the idea of her being an, a personal being, right? Like you can. She's a, she's meant to. Um, She's a bodhisattva, right? But it's like there, there's levels of understanding reality and understanding what what is real and what isn't real. Yeah, but also there, there are the idea of those the vast too. Well, my I can't hear anything with this the wind up here. Yeah, yeah. Jesse, can you? 
that there's the idea of the devas too yeah mm -hmm. and so your question of like whether they exist or not and is it useful to call upon them yeah i feel like i feel like the devas may help yeah <laughs> for sure i i mean I wouldn't worry about it too much. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like, just like Michelle saying on the one hand that this sense of the spirit of Kuan Yin is real, the, the spirit of infinite compassion, right? That's like beyond all unrestrained compassion is real. Whether it's like a personalized being and whether it's historical or present right now, I mean, in some ways trying to fit it into a box starts to make it you dissipate the connection anyway. So there's a way of like realness is it's like, if we can experience that sense of that quality of heart or the aspiration for that quality of mind, heart, then that's what do we need? What's more real, you know, in terms of anything, you know, uh, even in terms of ourselves. And I think that the devas, it's like, if you feel like you have a relationship with beings that are not necessarily seen, then what's, what's what's why doubt it you know why why not have a sense of like oh the sense of company and the sense of presence and the sense of our community being more than just the human beings you know in our sangha or in our building or even the animal beings that if, if there's a sense of connection with spirit beings whether they're just invisible or whether they're embodying in a tree or a pond or you know like a a physical reality you know it's if it's helpful it's good you know and of course there's plenty in the suttas that you see of those being real considered real and important connections you know but i think you're you're i mean i feel your sense of and then it is it's like, if you feel it, it's real. That's all the Buddha could say, right? I mean, that's what the Buddha said about everything. And if you don't have a sense of it, if it's not uh, perceptible, is it real? Can you say that there is a self? If it's not, if, if you're not directly perceiving it, you can perceive emotion and thought and wanting and all of these things. But if there isn't the sense of what, you know, we're not looking for that, which is not directly visible. So the sense of it does, is meta real? Does meta work? It's like, if you feel it, that's all of the proof you need. The question of what impact it has, you know, in the world around us. I think that there's an appropriate place of, you know, some sense of faith that, it's not only real and not only meaningful for, you know, our own little minds that, that love doesn't actually exist only in this body, that there's something outside of space and time, right? That Srinivasa is pointing to. It's important at times, but also it's also important at times to not need to be like, you feel metta, you feel kindness, you feel tenderness, whether it's through family or through Kuan Yin or through the devas, it doesn't matter because the quality of heart is real. And whatever the impact is, and can you save someone's life with that? Or can you heal yourself or all of these other things? Who knows, you know, but the sense of like the realness of the experience should be the, that's the um, essence of the practice, you know, the deepest faith. Like for the Ukrainians, I just um, do meta for them. It seems appropriate. How about the how about the Russians? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Not Putin, though. <laughs> I mean Maybe that. Later. I think that's so important that this, that part of like understanding that metta is not, we're not sending metta to behavior. We're getting the, this, the felt sense of a being like a newborn child. It's like that usually if you bring a newborn into the room people will have a felt sense of connection that isn't determined by behavior and i think that 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 is so critical 
to our understanding of metta. And I, I do think that I learned a lot by, I'm so grateful when I went to Burma because I would see that people had a, a very, very personal relationship with the Buddha, for example, or Davis, so that, you know, when I first saw somebody put a, a, a coat around the Buddha statue when it was cold and saw somebody brushing the Buddha's teeth, I didn't grow up with stuff like that. So it, I found it like shocking. And then I started getting that to have that kind of personal relationship um, can also be very, per very important whether it's, it could not be the Buddha, it could be our cat, <laughs> but it's like some kind of relationship that softens the heart. And it's like the, the, the people I met in Burma were very much like the Buddha had just walked by yesterday. It was very close, very intimate, very personal, but we're all meant to transform that, transform it also and to understand its impersonal nature, the anatta, wisdom side of it but I think sometimes the way that these teachings have been brought from that place of a more personal relationship with Davis or the Buddha sometimes there's a hesitation to let the heart <laughs> get that soft or uh, relational and I think that's very sad For example, it doesn't have to be Kuan Yin, it could be an owl, an owl, but I think we need that. We need some kind of relationship with something that we respect and call for help um, when we need it. It's true because like in time needed, I also call on Mary too. I believe in that. <laughs> She does exist. <laughs> she sure did. I mean, she's a person that lived. And, you know, it's like with all these beings, I really do, you know, why not call them all in? You know, who, who, it, I don't see why we have to be um, so miserly with ourselves. <laughs> I'll just, I want to say just based on kind of the one of the last things Michelle was saying of, the part of it that isn't to remember that it's also not personal, that it's like, if we can send, you know, metta and we say send, but really it's a sense of connecting in our own heart and mind with a caring for, you know, you say like the Ukrainians, right. And this idea of like, Oh, the, the people who are the, you know, victims of, of violence and of hardship and depression. And, and there's a, a, a place where we have a natural sort of sympathy for that, but, you know, harder, of course, for most of us to find a sense of kind of connection and caring for the the individuals that we think of as being responsible for perpetuating the violence and harm, but it, to remember that there that there is also that impersonal side, and it's like because there's a side of it that's about us, you know. There is of all these people we don't like and have projections as the bad guys in the world, right? That there is a part of our, they're in ourselves as well. And so do we have, do we abandon that part of ourselves as well? Do we deny our own hearts, the sort of corners of our hearts that are, you know, bullies or mean or impatient or all of these things? Like, do we deny those parts of ourselves love and kindness as well? Cause that ends up being the cost, right? It's like, it's not only that we're, we think we might be able to punish our enemy through not caring for them, that actually we're, we're starving ourselves, right? From the love and kindness. And so where do we also see that we don't like these parts of ourselves either? And yet, how do we start to be able to fold them into the field of, of caring and of worthiness? It doesn't mean that we approve of behavior. It doesn't mean that there isn't remorse or um, uh, correction in terms of, you know, or, or just permission to act out whatever stuff, but a baseline sense of the, the worthiness and the, the conditioned 
reality of any behaviors or, or kind of patterns um, is important too. This practice ah. <laughs> <laughs> to go now, past past the illusion first. One one of the things that I think is very important is that when you're right now, if you're from the United States, not everybody here is, but it's like depending on who gets um, voted in as president, when you go through the border, it's horrible. I mean, it's just horrible. You know, it's like, do I say, no, I, I didn't vote for this person and like, please like me or yes, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> like I'm, I just came from the States, right? It's like, we have to, we have to look at like, if we can't send Meta to the Russian, then it's like, we better watch out because there's a lot of people who don't appreciate Americans, right? It's like, and so it's really that, again, that being willing to see that the, in the depth of the Buddhist teaching, um, you're meant to start with what's easy. And I, I'm going to wrap this up very quickly in that, um, when I learned metta from Upandita, at a certain point, um, he did have me choose a, a few people to have around me that were um, people I respected and admired, you know, like a group. So you, you see what I mean? Like if I, I, I have never done it, but I could imagine if I really felt like bringing C, Sri Nazargadatta, the Buddha, Kuan Yin, right? You know, Rumi, you know, I don't, I don't feel like, why should I like hold back? Like if I'm needing that kind of sending metta back and forth until it becomes abiding in metta with these beings, they've all lived, you can access their energy. And if it's powerful energy, you're not going to call in destructive energy for metta practice, right? You're going to you find a way to ultimately, as, as Jesse's saying, you're finding a way into your own heart. So it's great questions, you know, so and it's really important because we all need to be reminded of of this. Yeah. And I feel sorry for the young Russian too. So you can have a, a you can have a bunch of Ukrainians and then add the Russians on the other, you know, in the next right? You don't have to have the Russians right close. You could have them in the next row. But I really mean it. It's like when Upandita taught me to make a circle around me of beings that were I felt safe with, it, it's not far-fetched to do it, to do it this way. That's very helpful.
Well, Michelle? There was one thing I was going to read by Pablo Neruda where he said, uh, why do we hate so much those who hate us? And then later on in that poem, he says, but hate, hate is a loser. Hate is a loser. And I think it's really important that we need, we need so much support to find that this deeper love, the deeper love without conditions, no conditions on it for ourselves. We, we have, we, we need, we need so much metaphor when we're motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion, Never mind others. It's like that loving or being safe and protected from inner and outer harm, that real, um, not conditional love. We need it so much. And everybody does. Babies die without it. That's how important it is. So lucky us, we get to access it, cultivate it, deepen it. May we be safe and protected from inner and outer harm. May we be happy and peaceful of heart. May we be strong and healthy of body. May we take care of ourselves happily while living on this earth. I'll take care, everybody. And maybe just a reminder, announcement that, you know, our online, a five-day online retreat begins next Friday. There's still room if anyone wants to join and you haven't so far. But that next Sunday, the um, the format for the Sunday sitting will be just a little bit different. It'll be the a Dhamma talk. Uh, so there won't be a sitting or a QA. and a It'll just be the, the talk um, for the retreat. And then the following Sunday, we'll be back at our normal Sunday sitting schedule. So we look forward to seeing you all then, one way or another. Mm. Take care. Oh, yeah. Oh? <laughs> yeah, uh, I got a, Wendy sent me a message that the, I had to fix some stuff on the website around the time zone difference. So you can check and it's a little bit different. Um, I'll send an email out tomorrow. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Michelle.